This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you so much. And I've, um, I've brought my little friend Prezi with me, which I hope all you teachers in the room are using other than PowerPoint these days, because it doesn't have words. It just has cool little pictures, which maybe will still uh, put you to sleep. Um, Thank you so much for having me. I've been really lucky to talk to um, students in a bunch of places like Yale and Princeton and Harvard and MIT and Santa Barbara and Berkeley and, and uh, UCLA and to public health groups in wonderful conference places like Disneyland or physicians dealing with obesity and diabetes in places like uh, Saudi Arabia here for this recent talk. But I've never been able or allowed to actually read from my book, Salt, Sugar, Fat, and I'm going to do that here today. And by the way, I laugh every time I see the cover because it was designed by this crazy Russian emigre who lives upstate in New York who, to do it, went into his grocery store and pulled out his favorite products off the shelf and brought it back to his studio and hand-ripped the lettering out of them and rearrange the letters to reflect what is really going on about the products that he and I and you probably to some extent love so deeply, um, which of course is what, the, is what the book is all about. And I'm, and I'm actually not gonna read from the book, but I'm going to cite a couple of facts from it. Um, in 2002, the largest food company of all, Nestle, paid $2.6 billion for the Hot Pocket brand, that frozen, microwavable delicacy that became a poster child for, let's say, exuberant snacking. And five years later, Nestle acquired the rights to this drink, which helped it corner the market on one of the grimmest results of overeating. Every year in this country, some 200,000 people undergo bariatric surgery to physically shrink their stomach as a way of helping them to actually eat less. Um, so gorge on the hot pocket, get fat on the hot pocket, and then Eat through a tube was Nestle's marketing strategy, if you will. Get them fat, get them thin. It's on page 337 of the book. So imagine my surprise, now summer before last, when I got a call from none other than Nestle's research and development organization on the lovely shores of Lake Geneva, asking me to come give my book talk to their secret gathering, not secret, private gathering of 60 R&D people, maybe 70 or 80 from all over the world that they had, they had gathered. Um, and, um, and my first reaction was, what? And when I told my son Aaron, who is with us in the audience today about it, his reaction was, I hope you're not spending my future tuition money on a round trip ticket to Geneva because <laughs> There's no way they're gonna let you come back home. They're going to shove you off the Matterhorn. But, but know that the R&D team had a new head who convinced me that he was trying to turn a corner at Nestle. They had read the book. They were responding to changing consumer demands. And in order for them to do good, they needed to hear more from people like me about all the bad things that they had done. And remember though, this is the richest company in the food business, or certainly is from year to year. Nestle is the owner of 29 of what it calls the billionaire brands. As one of its research scientists put it to me, Nestle is the Swiss bank that prints food. <laughs> but I decided to go 
in part because I wanted to know what their 350 PhDs were up to these days who work on exclusively on food. So I went, I actually took Aaron with me as a, as a uh, bodyguard. This is the group <laughs> right before I got up to give my little spiel. And, and I'm giving you a little bit of the shortened version of what I said to, what I said to Nestle. Um, and I started out with the fact that in 2008, I was actually in Algeria writing about jihadi militants when a couple of FBI agents showed up at the New York Times headquarters looking for me. I had been traveling to Iraq and to the Middle East, first tormenting the Pentagon for failing to equip American and then Iraqi soldiers with armor, and then looking at how the war in Iraq was was fueling the ability of recruiters uh, in other parts of the world to recruit new jihadis, like Abu Omar here, whose job, as he showed me, was building better and more uh, deadly IEDs to, to kill more Americans. And I had ended up in Algeria writing about insurgents there uh, when the newspaper decided it was probably time for me to come home and find something safer to do. And I mentioned this really only because I went from one war to another. I was having coffee with my editor at the New York Times on the 14th floor cafeteria. And I think I was still pitching her a story about US arms sales overseas, something like that, when she said to me, you know, Michael, what do you think about peanuts? <laughs> And I go, come on, Christy. I mean, let me tell you about these missiles and this tear gas, and it's going here. And she goes, she goes, no, no, listen to me. There's been an outbreak of salmonella in peanuts being manufactured by a factory in Georgia on the Alabama border, and people are getting sick all over the country. And I'm still kind of demurring, and she's going, look, Michael, think about it. And, and investigative editors like to think of base notes for big, potentially big stories to work on. And she says, look. You know, these peanuts aren't being manufactured by China or some other far off place. We can't blame them for this one. This is of our own making. Thousands of people are being sickened. There are even people starting to die in most states across the country. And these peanuts are being used by, as ingredients by this $1 trillion processed food industry about which we really know very little. And sure enough, when I went down to Georgia and spent some time reporting on the ground, that outbreak became the story about how that industry had lost control over its food chain. Weeks and weeks were going by and the largest companies were still trying to figure out if they were using those peanuts in their products and then eventually recalling those products to ensure um, safety of consumers. And my reporting on, on food safety next took me to, um, to, to Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, where I was incredibly lucky to come across a trove of documents that allowed me for the first time to tell the story of the making of a hamburger that sickened many people uh, because of an E. coli contamination, including Stephanie Smith here. She was a 22-year-old dance instructor who had a burger at her mom's house for Sunday supper one week and a week later, uh, coming out of a, a forced coma, she was paralyzed from the waist down because of the of the E. coli in the hamburger. And, and Stephanie allowed me to sort of put a human face on this trove of documents. And the story of that contamination was an industry that intentionally avoided knowing about its food chain in order to avoid costly recalls. They did not want to trace back um, the hamburger sources to, um, to the slaughterhouses because that would then be traced forward to other, uh, other manufacturers. In this case, it was Cargill um, uh, creating the hamburger. And I was, I was having dinner with one of my best sources, Mansoor here, who tests pathogens for the meat industry. And by the way, it was Mansoor who Chipotle hired recently to turn its company around from a food safety standpoint. I mean, but he said to me, you know, Michael, as, as tragic as these episodes of contamination are, you really should look at what my industry, he was talking about the meat industry, is intentionally adding to its products over which it has absolute control. 
and he was talking about none other than salt, especially huge in processed meats, which got me thinking about sugar and got me thinking about fat as well. And so that, that became the impetus to the research and the reporting that, that took me through for the book. And, and one of the first things I had to grapple with was, well, of course we already know that eating too much of food, I like to call the stuff we hate to love, can make us you know, unhealthily overweight and otherwise ill. But once again, I was amazingly lucky to come across a mountain of documents, emails and white papers and memos and strategy papers that put me at the table of the largest food companies in the world as they were formulating and strategizing and marketing their products. And it was those documents that enabled me to identify key players in those companies and then convince them to talk to me and open up and tell me even more secrets about their work. And, and the overwhelming sense of that material in those interviews, which is, which is what the book is about, is, is a sense that this is an industry that's driving 24 seven, not just to get us to not just like their products, but to want more and more of them. There's no word that they hate more than, than the A word, addiction. And they will justifiably argue that, look, you really can't compare you know, Oreos with, with drugs or what have you. And, and, and I think that there's some validity to that, but they don't even need to use the A word in describing their efforts to maximize the allure of their products. They talk about maximizing snackability and craveability. And one of my favorite terms is more-ishness. <laughs> These aren't English majors, right? These are bench chemists, marketing people describing their efforts. And look, it's, it's not like, it's also not like this is, this, I view this as this evil empire that intentionally set out to make us overweight or otherwise ill. I mean, these are companies doing what all companies want to do, which is to make as much money as possible by selling as much product as possible. The problem lies in their own sort of deep dependence on using gobs of salt, sugar, and fat to sort of get to that, um, get to that sort of ideal product in their, in their eyes, which is low cost, convenient, and utterly irresistible. Um, I was incredibly, uh, lucky to spend time with a legend in the industry named Howard Moskowitz, who's responsible for many of the icons in the grocery store. He was trained in high math at Queens College and then experimental psychology at Harvard. And, and Howard walked me through one of his recent creations, which was a new soda flavor for Dr. Pepper, in which he started with no less than 60 versions of sweetness, each one just slightly different than the next and subjected those to his 3000 plus consumer taste tests around the country and then took the data through it in his computer, did his high math regression analysis thing and out came uh, typically charts like this, a bell shaped curve where at the top of the curve is not the dreaded middle C you get in school, but rather the perfect amount of sweetness not too little, not too much. It was Howard Moskowitz who coined the term the bliss point to describe that perfect amount of sweetness. And when you talk to nutritionists, you realize that the problem is not that the food industry has created, or in Howard's word, engineered bliss points for things like ice cream and cookies and soda, things we know and expect to be sweet. It's that they've marched around the grocery store adding sugar to products that didn't used to be sweet before. So now breads have added sugar and an engineered bliss point for sweetness. Some yogurts can still have as much sugar per serving as ice cream. One of my favorite spots in the grocery store is the pasta sauce aisle where some brands can have the equivalent of a couple of Oreo cookies with a sweetness and a tiny half cup serving. And what this does is teach us to expect sweetness in everything we eat, which is a real problem for kids, especially because they are born hardwired for sweet taste. So when you drag them over 
to the produce aisle and try to get them interested in things like Brussels sprouts and celery and broccoli, you're going to get a rebellion on your hands. Um, but it's not just sugar, of course. If, if you were to draw a drug analogy, which I hesitate to do, but if you were to compare sugar to amphetamine, fat to the food industry is the opiate for its also very powerful, very subtle way of sneaking up on you, not with a bliss point, but with what the industry calls the mouth feel, because as you all know, um, fats are still not quite uh, accepted as an official taste, but rather that sensation, uh, thanks to the trigeminal nerve of biting into a warm toasted cheese sandwich. You can tell I'm a bit of a salt and fat guy because the reward center of my brain is going off because that's connected to the, to the, to the pleasure centers of your brain just as much as, as, as sugar is. And one of the things that industry learned with fat is I write in the book that they could use the excess processed cheese that they were generating as an ingredient in processed foods to increase the allure of those products. And so that's why sandwich shops, uh, through a very strategic um, uh, joint venture between industry and the government, began offering and promoting and marketing cheese on every sandwich you eat. And you can walk through the grocery store and so many products now have added cheese in it, not, not cheese for its own lovely sense of eating, but cheese as an added ingredient with those, those extra calories. And then there's salt, of course, which is a strange creature. I don't even know what the drug analogy to salt is. I mean, these days it's methadone because they're, they're trying to come up with salt substitutes, right? Because our salt consumption typically is like so much higher than then certainly some, some scientists think we, we, we should be eating because of the, the links to high blood pressure and, and, and heart disease. Um, but the real eye-opener for me was, was the moment when I asked some of the larger food companies, why are you using so much salt, not in things I expect to be salty, but just in your, your across-the-board processed foods, and none other than Kellogg's invited me in to show me what salt meant to them. And not only did I get to tour their R&D factory, but they sat me down and prepared for me special versions of some of the biggest icons in the grocery store without using any salt in them at all. And so we started with the, um, we started with the Cheez-Its, which I managed to take a little snapshot of here. Normally I could eat those day in, day out, but without salt, we couldn't even swallow them. They tasted, they stuck rather to the roof of our mouth because salt adds texture and solubility. We moved on to the frozen waffles, put them in the toaster, and they came out looking and tasting like straw because salt adds color and flavor. And then we moved on to the cornflakes, put them in the bowl, added some water, tasted, took a, took a, took a bite, and before I could say anything, the chief spokeswoman for the company was sitting there. She gets this look of horror on her face, and she swallows and blurts out the word metal. I taste metal, M-E-T-A-L, and the chief technical officer is there, and he starts chuckling. He goes, yeah, not, not everybody will get this, but one of, the, one of the beautiful things that makes salt such a miracle ingredient to us is that it will mask some of the off notes, bad taste, that are inherent to some processed foods. In this case, some of the added minerals to the cornflakes would give you what I had, a sensation of one of my fillings coming loose and sloshing around in my mouth. And that's when I really got it, which is as dependent as we've become on large amounts of salt, sugar, fat, the industry itself is even more dependent on them, which is a real problem for it now because those same companies like Nestle are now trying to change. Um, but I went on with Nestle and I said, look, as you guys know, it's not just salt, sugar, fat. It's the marketing, of course, that goes into the products. And increasingly marketing people 
began to run the largest food companies. I had a wonderful time with Ed Martin, who was part of a SWAT team at Kellogg's um, when they were losing market share to General Mills. And he told me how they sat around one day and they schemed up this thing called Rice Krispies Treat Cereal. And they, 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 and, and they thought, well, that's a great idea. Let's give it to the technicians and let them work it out. And the poor technicians came back and pulling their hair out said, we can't do it. I mean, every time we try to add marshmallow to the cereal, it turns to mush and mush is the death of cereal. So the marketing people went back to their consumer panel and said, look, we can't quite do this. Guys, help us out. And they said, well, look, you don't really have to give us marshmallow. You, you, you can probably just give us the sensation of marshmallow, the taste, the flavor, or the smell, and that'll be powerful enough for us. And the, the industry coined the term permission. We will give you permission to fool us if you just get close enough to the real thing. Rice Krispie Treat cereal without the real marshmallows became a huge hit for, for Kellogg's. Um, I spent a whole chapter on the Lunchables because it's just, it's just absolutely fascinating. I got, I got to meet and spend lots of time with the inventor of the Lunchables, Bob Drain, who, who just, you know, <coughs> who, 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 who's still amazed to this day that they managed to turn, you know, little pieces of processed cheese and processed meat and crackers, something nobody would be even interested in eating necessarily into a billion dollar a year brand that kids would get excited about. But at one point in the process, they learned and decided and were, were sort of known for saying among themselves that, that they realized that Lunchables wasn't about the food as much as it was the badge value, the, 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 the great buzz that gave to the kid who pulled one of these Lunchables out on the lunchroom. He or she became the cat's meow of the lunchroom. And so they came up with that slogan for the kids, all day you gotta do what they say, but lunchtime is all yours. The food industry is incredibly smart about hitting, finding and hitting those emotional buttons, which really for, uh, for, for, for much of the time is what drives us to, 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 um, to eat. And then of course, there was Jeffrey Dunn. For 20 years, he was the fiercest warrior at this company. He rose to become president of Coca-Cola for North America, South America. Jeffrey Dunn walked me through Coke's pioneering of the Super Size Me phenomena where they, they decided they could make more money by offering unlimited amounts of drink, uh, soda, Coca-Cola to people in restaurants because really the ingredients didn't cost that more even for the mega sizes. Um, the the warlike language they used in their competition with Pepsi where they would refer to their best customers, people who would drink two or three Cokes a day or more, not as their best customers, but as heavy users. And, and their targeting of people like Tatiana here, um, who I caught up with in a corner store in Philadelphia, knowing that when kids walk into a store with a little bit of their own spending money and make those first decisions, about what to buy, they will become imprinted on that product, on that brand. And that's why Coke, the envy of solid food manufacturers around the world, focused so hard on putting Cokes in the hands of kids at ballparks, knowing that sort of that joyous moment of a kid being with their parent and getting that product in their hand. It was worth, was worth gazillions in advertising, um, in implanting that, that wonderful memory in, in the kid's head. Um, and of course, there's the analogy to tobacco, which isn't just an analogy. Many of us have forgotten that back in the 1980s, the largest tobacco company in North America, eventually the world, became the largest food manufacturer, Philip Morris. Through its acquisition of General Foods, the old food conglomerate out of New York, um, and Kraft. And I was lucky to spend time with 
um, some, of the, some of the former CEOs of Philip Morris explaining to me how they lent some of their marketing practices for cigarettes to their food managers um, at Kraft and General Foods, which also led me to write about in the beginning of the book sort of this, this wonderfully powerful moment back in 1999 when the heads of the largest food companies got together privately by, brought together by cabals of insiders within their own companies who were becoming increasingly concerned about their culpability in the growing obesity, not just obesity, but other health crises. And up before them stands a senior official at the biggest company of all, Kraft. He's armed with 72 slides, including this one here that he's showing to the CEO. And he lays at their feet responsibility, not just for the growing um, obesity situation, but diabetes, uh, gout, several types of cancers. And he pleads with the executives to start doing something meaningful to turn a corner and in part reformulate their products to be truly healthier. Um, he sits down and as I write in the book, one of the biggest, most powerful CEOs in the room stands up and is visibly angry and says, look, we are already <clears throat> sensitive to what consumers want. If they want a low fat this or a low sugar this, we make it, it's on the shelf there, they have options. But you've got to remember that we are also beholden to shareholders and there is no way we're going to mess around with the company jewels referring to salt, sugar, fat, if that's, um, if that's going to lead to lower sales because we would not be responsible then to those shareholders. And by and large, that's still the basic story of the food industry today, even though it's changing. Oh, and because it was Nestle, I reminded them that they uh, were sending boats like this up and down the Amazon <clears throat> finding new ways to market their products to people who were still entirely cooking by scratch, figuring out they could, they could sell many versions of their products, and all the big companies are doing it, um, uh, to the emerging middle class in, uh, in Brazil. Um, and then I sat down and I spent the next two days at Nestle, Oh, by the way, to some, some mild, mildly pleasant applause from the, the R&D people. Um, spending time with them, looking at sort of what they were doing to reformulate their products. And I have to say, it was, it was fairly impressive. I mean, they're taking, they're, they're, they're trying to minimize or reduce the amount of salt that they're using by, um, by taking it out of products internally and concentrating it on the surface of products. So it provides that, that, that um, what the industry calls flavor burst sort of immediately to the tongue and the saliva and the reward center. So you can get basically more bang for your buck. Um, they showed me how they were taking fat globules and expanding the surface area um, so you would have more contact of the fat with your mouth for again, bigger mouthfeel bang for the, uh, for the buck. And of course, how they were trying to replace caloric sweeteners with, with non-caloric sweeteners in changing some of their products like the, like the hot prockets. But, but here's kind of the rub. And, and in, in, in some ways I have a bit of a confession too, because as much as I focused on salt, sugar, fat, and as much as I talked about the solution to the problem of companies adding too much salt, sugar, fat is obviously reducing the salt, sugar, fat. When you talk to nutritionists, that's typically not the first thing that they say to you. The first thing they will say to you is that, we all need to be doubling the amount of this stuff that we eat. Um, and if we do that, we're gonna be way more than halfway home to, to better health from the food that we have. Um, and, and, and kind of even the rest of the stuff will start to some extent taking care of, of itself. 
And so I started, and, and when I asked Nestle about that, and their scientists, I said, look, okay, I appreciate that you're reducing the salt, sugar, and fat in these products, but, but what are you doing to stuff the Hot Pockets with this stuff? I got a blank stare because, in fact, that's one of the most difficult things for the processed food industry now, which is not decreasing the bad boy ingredients in their products, it's increasing the good stuff is a real challenge for them. And so I started thinking about, well, what would, what would my food giants, excuse the possessive, what would my food giants do if they suddenly had to start selling fresh vegetables and fruit? And the, and, the, and the cynics among us would probably guess, well, they would smother them with cheese sauce or fried caramel glazing. But no, if the rules was they had to sell produce as it was without ruining the nutritional profile of this, what would they do? And I'm convinced they would sort of go to their tried and true three things that make processed food so, um, so successful. They would make it more convenient. They would make it, um, they would make it more, um, more lower cost. They would lower the cost of it. And they would do things to make it, if not irresistible, at least more interesting in order to increase consumption. Um, and I think probably, you know, for the, for the, for the lower the cost, they would go to the agricultural community and say, hey guys, remember how we told you to grow soybeans and field corn, which are the staples of our foods? Forget that, we want you to grow fresh vegetables and fruits now. And sure enough, in the Midwest, I ran across ag extension programs, which were teaching field corn and soybean farmers how to switch over to grow vegetables and increase um, increase supply, if not demand, in that way. Um, lo and behold, I also ran across your very own Thomas Bjorkman here, who is working on the R&D end of things because last time I looked, the industry was spending $2 billion a year on research and development to make soy and corn more profitable for farmers. And I had trouble coming up with a mere $100 million in research and development for all vegetables and fruits. And that's an, that's an uneven playing field that's very significant. So I'm convinced that my food giants would increase the amount of money they put into research, into science to make vegetables more attractive, more tasty, fresher, more long lasting, if you will, in the shelf. Um, and, um, and then also I'm convinced that they would sort of fiddle around with the grocery store. And I ran across these, these guys in New Mexico practicing nudge marketing. They were going into supermarkets and fiddling with the grocery cart. And they did some experiments where they, in fact, um, these, these, um, the, one of these, one of these um, scientists came out of the Cornell Food Lab, actually, um, Colin Payne, and um, did an experiment where he put some duct tape down the middle of a grocery cart and a sign in the front saying, put your vegetables in the front half of the shopping cart. And that little nudge led to a doubling in produce sales in the grocery stores where they did this experiments. But he also was playing around when I caught up with him by putting, with putting mirrors in the front of the cart. Because the idea is when you walk into the grocery store, everything about it is designed to sort of get you off your game plan and make spontaneous purchase decisions and to kind of forget about who you are. So his idea was if we could remind people of who they were as they're shopping in the store, they'll reconnect kind of with the consequences of those purchase decisions and remember the reality outside the store. Instead, what you get is this la la music and, and bright colors and so again, sort of this la la atmosphere. So he's starting picture, and I love this one because this, this photo is reflecting the image of the person uh, pushing the cart. He was in El Paso. And, and the mirror that they had come up with was, was, was sort of um, was rectangular, and he had suggested turning it this way so he would get the image of this part of his body because he had a very uh, substantial 
stomach. But the real biggest thing I think that the food joints would do to increase consumption of fruits and vegetables would be to turn to their tried and true friends on Madison Avenue and find those emotional buttons to push that could drive consumption of vegetables like they drive consumption of Snickers bars and what have you. Um, so it took a while, but I managed to find an advertising firm to do an ad campaign for me um, uh, for a vegetable and, and, and not any vegetable, but I settled on a vegetable that tends to, tends to cause issues for a good number of people, especially of my generation, if they had parents who cooked it to mush and then made you, and then made you eat it. And not only that, but this advertising agency agreed to do this campaign and let me watch them do it and videotape it. And it was like being inside a madman and woman segment <laughs> where, they're, where they're doing their sort of genius thing. And so I'm gonna show you a couple of snippets of the, of the video that we made of their process trying to come up with this, um, this campaign for the problem vegetable. I do not like broccoli. I haven't liked it since I was a little kid. <laughs> and my mother made me eat it. And I'm president of the United States. And I'm not going to eat any more <laughs> I hope you remember that guy. Broccoli is not a popular vegetable. It was derided by President George Bush, and it's pretty much ignored by the rest of us. I'm Michael Moss, and I write about the intersections of food and marketing for the New York Times. Well, and I'm trying to answer the question. What would it take to get people to eat better? <coughs> Advertising firm like Susan Sorrell, whose previous clients include Fidjones, General Mills, and Coca-Cola, took on the challenge pro bono. Okay, and about halfway through the process, um, and this went on for weeks and weeks. I mean, the, these are people who can turn around and add for Porsche in like a couple of days, but they were pulling their hair out and, and because this was like a real challenge. I mean, it's one thing to sell junky stuff or speed or sex to people, but broccoli? But at one point they decide, okay, look, Michael, you're not giving us any money, but even in the real world, we probably wouldn't have money for primetime TV. We gotta like start slowly here. Let's, let's do some social media campaign stuff and let's, we're gonna pick a fight with another product in the grocery store. And I thought, oh boy, they're gonna go after, you know, one of my favorites, potato chips, or maybe they're gonna go after french fries in the restaurant. And they go, no, 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 no. You're forgetting your own book. Remember how you wrote about how the supposed war between Pepsi and Coca-Cola was like a bloody war and in fact it was totally bloodless because those two companies figured out that every time they attacked each other or every time Pepsi got Michael Jackson to come up with a new ad, the sales of both companies would rise because it brought buzz to the soda aisle. And so they decided to pick a fight with somebody else in the grocery store. And this is a video snippet of these madmen and women actually at work, sitting around the table, trying to come up with this, <coughs> with this uh, campaign strategy. So our key consumer insight that we're working with is that everyone is currently talking about kale. Um, it is everywhere. This is Bon Appetit magazine. There's a whole section on the vegetable revolution in here. And there's a timeline around when all of these vegetables had their it moments. Broccoli is not on the thread. There's nothing new or exciting to say about broccoli. So our challenge is going to be how to change the visual communication, the visual style of broccoli in culture. That all of that said, broccoli is exactly cool. So maybe there's something cool not. Like, you don't want to do that anymore, but maybe, you know, maybe they're in on the joke. I mean, the fact that broccoli's having its own campaign, I think have a lot of fun with it. So you're basically saying, like, I don't want you to live longer. Here's something that's going to do that. So I mean, that's probably, probably a better gift than flowers. <laughs> <laughs> so that drops out at the end, but he said, is it a bro case? Okay. So, 
this is how these you know advertising people you know get their juices up by sitting around thinking of silly things like that but in fact they came up with a campaign um i came up with a story this is it landed on the cover of the new york times magazine and i'm still I'm still kind of amazed that the New York Times editors put it on, in the magazine, not to mention on the cover, because it was entirely fictitious. There was no campaign. There was no broccoli grower that was buying this advertising for their product. But we did it, and this is one of the ad strategies. <laughs> and boy, did I hear it from the kale people, right? And I'm still hearing it from the kale people. But they were having fun, and that was, that was the first lesson that they learned themselves and they relate to me, which is the last thing in the world we're gonna do is preach about broccoli, because the government has been preaching about broccoli to us for years and years, and sales haven't increased. We're gonna have fun, and we're gonna recreate broccoli's image to consumers. Um, but then something really interesting happened. Some students at another college, I won't mention, but it happens to be in New Haven, one of the, <laughs> one of the biggest food deserts in the country, right? A university surrounded by fairly poor people without a lot of shopping options, decided to take the campaign advertising that Victors and Spoils did and create real billboards and real signs, and they managed to double broccoli sales in New Haven with their real hands-on strategy. Um, one of the, the rather largest broccoli grower on the East Coast adopted the alpha vegetable strategy that Victors and Spoils came up with. Having seen that broccoli was a bit of a wallflower, timid, they decided to make it big and bold and dramatic and indeed, thanks to Thomas, this is one of their broccoli boxes. And you can go to their website and see a whole bunch of other sort of advertising strategy they're using. And then um, the Obama Let's Move campaign people got the, the um, Protus Association folks um, interested in doing something even more dramatically powerful, which was engaging some of our celebrities who endorse the junkiest food products out there to turn around and lend their good name and good faces um, to things like broccoli and, um, and in this case, um, in this case, citrus. Um, and, um, um, and it's taking off. Uh, the Produce uh, Association is actually now doing two experimental programs in two cities where they're trying to measure um, the ability of this kind of advertising campaign to, um, to increase sales. And I think that I'm hoping that if that data is as strong as it is, they'll be able to convince the produce growers themselves to start coughing up money for marketing. Again, look, there's no, there's no way that, ski, that, that spinach is ever gonna be able to compete for Skittles for that reward center of our brain, but they don't really have to match it. Just get close to it to have some dramatic impact in the grocery store where other things can happen too. None other than Walmart, I, um, I heard the other day in some of its stores in West Virginia, we're rejiggering the physical layout of grocery stores to increase the presence of vegetables. And I'll show you a little segment of, of this. So what happens when three West Virginia Walmarts decide to take the candy and chips out of one checkout out of the store and replace them with free candy and other healthy items? That's all I'm gonna show you, because the answer is they increased sales and it was working because the checkout counter is actually one of the most dangerous places in the shopper if you're thinking about health, because the stores know that that's when your guard is down and you're much more apt to impulse buy. And so that's why the soda companies started planting um, refrigerators there with sodas that you could buy at the last moment. Um, which brings me to this incredible sort of moment we're in now where we have this huge number of startup companies 
run in some cases by people from Silicon Valley, other cases food ag people like here at Cornell who are trying to, to use that awful word disrupt or reinvent sort of all segments of the grocery store. And it's, it's really sort of fun watching them try to do their, their thing. Um, some of them are coming up with products like this, which is Soylent, the drink, right? But others are coming up with um, really interesting things like this sort of reformulating a ketchup to substitute all the added sugar with like real vegetables instead. And in this case, the guys who invented that are a couple of military veterans from the Iraq war. Um, and the stuff actually tastes really good. Um, but one of the things that I'm most excited about is a number of the people I wrote about in the book um, who brought us things like the Lunchables and Coca-Cola and Rice Krispie Treat cereal have now switched sides, having, having some considerable misgiving about their life work. And they are now helping some of the startups scale up by lending some of their hardcore formulation and marketing strategy to these new companies. So Jeffrey Dunn of Coca-Cola fame, right, started putting baby carrots in vending machines and using advertising like the broccoli campaign to make baby carrots fun. Ed Martin, the guy who invented the Rice Krispies treat cereal for Kellogg's, is all excited about these things, which are cargo containers you can plop into any food desert. These were actually started to be used by pot growers, but he's got the idea of using them for lettuce, throw a little solar panels on the, the roof, and you have instant year-round accessible and hopefully um, affordable greens. Um, and then there's, um, then there's Sarah Brito from the Victors and Spoils um, broccoli campaign who you saw. Um, Sarah is pictured um, here, I'm backing up, sorry. Um, here is Sarah. Sarah uh, worked for Kraft and one of, her, one of her biggest hits was figuring out how to increase sales of mac and cheese. And, and as Sarah tells it, she was surveying neighborhoods, I think it was in Denver, and she walked into one family's house and they were sitting around talking. And, and she, said, um, she said to them, kind of confiding, that, hey, we were just at your neighbors and they were telling us how much they loved Kraft mac and cheese. And this light bulb went on in the people she was talking to and they said, really? And that's when Sarah sort of understood that they could market this as this shared secret among consumers. And so she came up with this campaign, you know you love it. Well, Sarah is now working for a group called the Chef's Collective, a bunch of people in the restaurant industry, cooks and what have you, who are trying to in reinvent restaurant menus um, and the foods in, in restaurants to make them just as delicious, but healthier for people, a really treacherous part of, the, um, <clears throat> of, the, of, of our food chain right now in terms of changing people's habits. And then there's Bob Drain, inventor of the uh, of before spoken Lunchables. Um, he has started advising a young man named Luke Saunders who is trying to disrupt one of the more difficult and or treacherous parts of the food system in this country, the vending machine. Luke, by the way, was a was an was a was an industrial oil salesman working in the Midwest when he went into a food factory that was making frozen crustless peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and Luke said what parent would serve these to their kids and the and the manager said it's not parents the schools are buying this because they no longer have kitchens to cook real food and Luke just kind of goes God, there's gotta be like a better way to do some of this food stuff. Luke came up with the farmer's fridge salad vending machine, which is actually working. It's fresh salad, it's affordable. He's got 
30 or 100 of these in the Chicago area now. Poor people, wealthier people are buying them. And Bob Drain is helping him sort of rethink the marketing strategy um, for the farmer's fridge. And it's a little scary because, because Drain is about you know, things like captive audiences. And he, and he goes to Luke, you know, look, you're putting these at 7-Elevens, but, but people drive to the 7-Eleven and that means they can drive down the street to Burger King. You're not, you're, you're gonna lose a lot of those people. Why don't you park these things in like a big office building where you have a captive audience, a targeted captive audience. And it's, the, it's this hardcore expression that may be, may be a little scary for food startup people who aren't used to thinking about their lovely product in, in, in that fashion. Um, this, by the way, is the original strategic marketing for, for Lunchable that, that, that made it so focused and so cunning. And Bob is trying to help Luke come up with a sort of similar marketing strategy for the, for the Lunchables. Um, and who knows? I mean, eventually, I think that going back to Nestle, that if you could use the tried and true food industry methods of lowering cost, increasing convenience, um, and increasing demand, um, that you'll not just get more produce sales in the produce aisle, I think you'll get the food giants themselves more keen on using more vegetables um, and or fruits in their products throughout the grocery store. So you don't even have to do the Walmart thing and put bananas at the checkout counter. You can have the essence of those bananas in food products where you don't anymore today and all the, the lovely nutritional value of, of that. Um, of course, there's always the food giants <clears throat> and they are trying their best now to reinvent their products too. This was a recent tasting in, um, in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, where Kellogg's had a stand where they were adding things like pork fat to Rice Krispies cereal, which was sort of their way of trying to reinvent their products. And who knows, they may succeed in some ways. Maybe this, maybe that, or maybe they'll just go back to this sort of tried and true method too. But I think that with a little bit of help from the food giants and their marketing strategies, a lot of these startups themselves can really start scaling up and make a really big difference in um, our eating habits and, and public health as a result of that. And lastly, I always forget that, but uh, this rather, but as I work on the next book, I'm is still out there engaging with people and tweeting through this address. So if any of you want to keep in touch uh, with me on that, um, on, on that scale, I'd be glad to. And that's all I have. Thank you so much for, for listening. Sure, if we have time, absolutely. Yeah, but the other beautiful thing about, about fruits and vegetables is you can do some processing. You can freeze, for example. I mean, one of my favorite things to buy this time of year are frozen blueberries, which if frozen correctly, can actually make a lot more ethical, moral sense, health sense than trying to buy fresh blueberries imported from who knows where. So I think there's actually a lot of cunning processing that the industry could do. And look, look, I mean, processing is not necessarily an evil wor word. And, and, and certainly I'm not about, about being anti all food processing. Otherwise I wouldn't be eating my favorite cheeses, for example. Um, it's, about, it's about controlling processed foods rather than letting them control us. And I think that that knowing as the food industries know that more and more people are caring about what they put in their bodies and they're, they're starting to make purchase decisions based on that, I, th I think they'll understand that they can't, they can't ruin those things and they may be able to incorporate them into, into, into products you know, where people need some convenience in their, in their lives. Yeah, the, the good news is that I think in many other countries, including France, there's sort of more mindfulness about food. And, and, I, and I know that the folks at the food lab here at Cornell have really paid close attention to that issue of mindfulness because it does seem to be, 
it does seem like there was this moment in the 1980s when suddenly overnight we became mindless about food and, and it became socially acceptable to eat anything, anywhere, anytime. And that's when you started people see people walk down the street and eating and drinking and bringing food into business meetings. And if I opened up a bag of chips right now and a little snack, you probably wouldn't be that shocked. And that played right into the hands of the food companies and making us less mindful about them. And so they started to engineer products you could eat with one hand and didn't need utensils while you were doing something, something else. And that led to snacking becoming this fourth American meal. I mean, in France still, people think we're crazy to, st I mean, why would you want to ruin your appetite before having a meal where you were going to sit down with friends and family and linger for a couple of hours enjoying kind of the sociability as well as the food itself. It's changing though, but because American processed foods are starting to spread around the world, not just to Saudi Arabia or Brazil, where I showed Nestle's boat, but in Europe as well. And so you're seeing increasing obesity and diabetes and in, in, in lots of the developed world as well. Um, uh, where the convenience and the allure of processed foods and or kind of the craziness of their lives is, 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 is making them more dependent on American style processed foods. Oh, uh, right. Um, yeah, I think potentially, but, but um, and you know, I used, to, I used to really, I used to really hate the idea of the soda tax um, as being regressive and hurting poor people who, you know, who, who um, um, you know, who, who, who are paying the tax, but, but I've sort of come around on that. But, but it's funny, because I, I, I put that question to Jeff Bible, the former CEO of Philip Morris, um, and in his Australian accent, which I can't mimic, he said to me, you know, Michael, look, I'm no fan of government, but, but when it comes to food, I mean, you have to remember, these food companies are so viciously competitive for space on the grocery shelf. And, and people are becoming so concerned about food these days that I think it could actually behoove the food companies to, to take it upon themselves actually to suggest some regulation relating to nutrition if only to sort of give them cover from Wall Street, because they're all under tremendous pressure to produce profits. And that pressure is, has just increased year after year after year. And that was sort of Jeff Bible's sense was it would be in the industry's own interest to sort of reach out. But I don't think they're gonna accept it coming the other way. I mean, I think there's just this inherent resistance to to having government intervention, especially if it doesn't make any sense to the, the food companies. I'd much rather see the change come from the food companies themselves, finding ways to continue making money um, uh, with healthier products. And, and I think they're starting, they're starting to try. All right, with that, let's go try some food. Hey. <laughs> okay, thank you, thanks. thanks. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.